Okay, if we could turn to the Gospel of John then, please. The Gospel of John and chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse 14, and we'll read down to verse 28. John 1, <clears throat> verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou, baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And again, God will bless that reading from his word to us as we consider this wonderful portion of scripture together. And we had uh, looked a little bit at verse 14 last time. We talked about the word uh, taking on this additional nature of flesh or humanity, and how uh, when he came into the world, he dwelt or tabernacled amongst us. And uh, John would testify, we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. And it's the phrase, the only begotten, that I want us to start with today. Uh, that phrase, because it's used by John more than once, he uses it in chapter 3, of course, that very famous verse that we're all familiar with uh, in verse 16, where he says that uh, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, it's used uh, again in verse 18. Uh, it says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only uh, begotten son of God. And so what does this phrase mean, this phrase only begotten? I'd like you to look with me, please, at Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17, where we find something very interesting in trying to grasp this uh, significance of this phrase. Hebrews 11 and verse 17, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, we know full well that Isaac was not Abraham's only son. Uh, but what we do know is that he was unique 
in his father's affections. No one could compete with uh, Isaac as far as Abraham was concerned in terms of affection. And so in the context here in John chapter one, we've just learned that actually there are many other children of God through faith in the Lord Jesus. Remember verse 12, as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, so there are many that are children of God through faith and sons of God through faith. But there's only one unique son that was, as we've learned, the word that was with God that was God. And so what it's emphasizing, this phrase, the only begotten son, is the one who is unique in the father's affection, none other like him, none to be compared with him. Uh, absolutely unique, uh, the only begotten. And so uh, John wants us to realize that. Uh, yes, there are many that will receive him and will be children of God, but there's only one, Lord Jesus Christ. And aren't we thankful that, that he is unique? There's nobody to be compared with him anywhere. And so uh, as well as this, we learn as well as being unique, uh, the unique uh, one, the word, the son, we learn that he is full of grace and truth. And one of the things we're going to learn about him is fullness. Uh, this one, uh, everything about him speaks of fullness. We, we'll, we'll see this more of his fullness we're going to learn as we all receive. And, and uh, in him. There's this fullness, and we read here that he is full of the sum total, if you like, of grace and truth are seen in him. And as we go through the Gospel of John, we're going to see both of these aspects revealed to us. He, he's going to show his amazing grace in his dealings, his unmerited favor to guilty sinners when he deals with the woman of Samaria, when he deals with the woman caught in adultery, as he deals with different individuals going through the gospel, we're going to see the fullness of undeserved, unmerited favor that is seen in him. And we're also going to see truth revealed in him in all its fullness. He's going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's going to, uh, in chapter 18, when he speaks specifically to Pilate, He's going to reveal himself in that the, the amazing truth chapter in John chapter 18. He's going to reveal that he indeed is the truth. And so he's full of grace and truth. Uh, this is what John wants us to understand concerning the Lord Jesus, the one who's that unique son who was in the bosom of the father. This one, he is full of grace and truth. And then uh, John the Baptist is revealed to us now as the witness. It says, John bear witness of him and cried saying, this was he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me for he was before for me. So he that comes after me because John, as we're going to learn, was the forerunner preparing the way for the Messiah. So he, he says uh, that he that cometh after me. Uh, so John is going before to prepare the way. But then he says, is preferred before me, ranks above me, far above me. Uh, in a sense, uh, I'm, I'm a witness, but he is the light. We've already heard he is that light which lights every man that comes into the world. And so he's preferred before me. And then he says this amazing statement, for he was before me. Now, I want us to just look back to Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel, chapter one, because if we're thinking in terms of human existence, Luke one, verse 36 it says, Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, 
And this is the six month with her who was called barren. And so what we can see clearly is that John the Baptist was conceived six months earlier than the Lord Jesus conception uh, in Mary. And so in terms of uh, age, he's six months older than the Lord Jesus. And yet John says, he's preferred before me because he was before me. And so even though he's six months older in terms of humanity, he's emphasizing Christ's eternality. He existed before me in eternity past. And that's why we've began in chapter one, verse one, where it talks about in the beginning was the word already in existence. The word was with God. The word was God. And then another scripture that would be pertinent to us to consider is in the prophecy of Micah. And if we go back to Micah chapter five, in the minor prophets, very familiar were all of us, even if we're not uh, very familiar with the minor prophets, we would be familiar with this verse. If I can find the book of Micah. <laughs> the problem with the minor prophets is there's a lot of them all stuck together and finding them can be challenging. I know he's right after Jonah. Here we go. Micah chapter five and verse two, it says, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. And here's the point we want to see whose goings forth have been from of old from everlasting. And so the point being that the one who was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the Messiah, the one who would rule, his goings forth have been of everlasting. And so it was this taking on flesh uh, that occurred uh, in Bethlehem of Judea six months after John the Baptist uh, was um, uh, born. The Lord Jesus was born, but John testifies to the fact that he was before me because he's the one that existed from all eternity past, the eternal son of God. And again, it's important for us to understand the, the truth, and I want to stress this, of the eternal sonship of Christ. Unto us a child is born, the prophet would say, unto us a son is given. The eternal son was given, a child was born. And so again, we're, we're taken back into etern eternity. John is testifying, bearing witness of him. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me in terms of his existence, because he's from all eternity. And then verse 16, it says, and of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace the one who was from all eternity who's full of grace and truth has certainly poured out that graciousness of his fullness and john could say we have all received we're all beneficiaries of his fullness it's been shown to us it's been poured out upon us and again we want to think of this wonderful phrase of his fullness Turn with me, please, to the book of Colossians, where Paul would take up this idea of his fullness. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Colossians 1, verse 19. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him, speaking of the Lord Jesus, should all fullness dwell. What does that mean? What is he speaking of? All fullness should dwell in him. Well, look at chapter two of Colossians and verse nine. For in him, again, speaking of the Lord Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. 
which is the head of all principality and power. And so this fullness that is found in the Lord Jesus, the sum total of all the attributes and the powers of the Almighty are found in him. And that fullness has been passed on to us. Christ is the source, if you like, of all the blessings that you and I have received. And notice he says, again, back in the passage of his fullness, have all we received. And the question is, who are the all that has received this fullness? And again, we, we go back to verse 12, as many as received him. To them gave he power, the right, the authority to become the sons of God, the children of God, even to those that believe on him. So we've come into this great fullness. In fact, Paul would tell us that you and I, we're one of the great mysteries is that we're indwelt by divine persons. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, we, we're indwelt by divine persons. So we've received fullness from him. And so it's just amazing, staggering, hard to get our minds around these things, to compre comprehend them. And the only reason we know they're true is because of revelation. Scriptures reveal them to us. And by faith, we believe them, but they're staggering for our minds to comprehend. And so he says, of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. Grace for grace, grace upon grace. It's like uh, kind of the waves lapping on the ocean shore. Uh, we have received from the Lord grace upon grace upon grace. And I, I think all of us can, can relate to this, that when we got saved, it was, it was all because of his grace. We didn't deserve it. We deserve hell. But because of his unmerited favor, he has gloriously saved us. But his grace was not exhausted at the cross. He daily pours out his undeserved favor upon us. And we're experiencing his grace. We talked about it when we were in 2 Corinthians, that uh, Paul was told, my grace is sufficient for thee. Uh, his daily sufficiency in all things comes to him. And so here we are, and I hope we are today, all of us on this, on this Zoom meeting, I hope we're all basking in the grace of God that is being given to us just grace upon grace, day after day, just receiving his undeserved favor, all his blessings, all his benefits, all his bounty is being poured out upon hell-deserving sinners, and he is showing us his amazing grace. And so he says, of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. And then he says, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And he wants us to, to grasp the wonder of grace. And sometimes the way we learn how great something is or how different something is, is by setting it in contrast with something else. And so he says, the law came through Moses. And when we think of the law uh, and how that came, we want to just contrast it for a moment with how grace came. I want you to look, please, at Hebrews again, Hebrews chapter 12 now. As we think of the, the giving of the law and what that was like, and then we're going to contrast it with grace. We're going to read from Hebrews 12, verse 18. He says, for you are not come to the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was that sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And so 
again, as we think about the giving of the law, what do we see? We see it emphasized you can't come near. Remember the stones that were put around the mountain as a kind of a barrier? Don't come, come cross this barrier. If an, even an animal would have gone through that barrier, it would have been, it would have been uh, shot to death, basically. And so, so the law emphasizes our separation from God, our distance from God, how we can't come near. Everything about the law is distance. And again, Paul would talk about that in Ephesians. You that were once afar off, we couldn't get near, uh, brought near through the blood of Christ. So the law, uh, separation from God, uh, written on stones, 2 Corinthians would tell us, symbolizing its inability to give life. It's just written on cold, lifeless stones. Uh, it, it can't give life. It can't touch the hearts of men. Neither can it be touched with the feelings of the infirmities of man as the word that became flesh could. And so the letter, uh, it didn't dwell amongst them. It, it stood aloof from them. It was a ministration of death. In contrast to that, the glory of grace. It's permanent in contrast to law, which was passing. Uh, it, it comes to us. And instead of emphasizing our distance, through grace, we're brought near. It brings to us reconciliation. And so how marvelous it is to bask in grace. In fact, the scripture would say that we should make sure that our hearts are established in grace. And it's wonderful to be a grace-orientated believer, to just bask in the grace of God. The fact that we're we're brought near through the blood of Christ. It's not a case of distance. We're not condemned now. We're justified. Uh, we're reconciled. We're, we're brought into a great place of privilege. And it was brought to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. The law given by Moses. Jews loved Moses. They elevated him. And of course, he was, he was faithful over all his house. And lots of good things said about Moses. But... What he brought in really caused terror, but grace and truth came to us by Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. I want you just to see this again in chapter 6 of John and verse 46. Just a repetition of this idea. John 6, verse 46. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. So, even though in the Old Testament, we acknowledge that there were these theophanies and Christophanies uh, that, that were revealed, but nobody in the Old Testament got a full-orbed view of God. Even Moses, let's look back at Exodus 33, uh, when, when he asked uh, to see God's glory, Exodus 33, let's just go back there. And we'll read from verse 18. He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I'll proclaim to thee the name of the Lord before thee. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. The Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away my hand. Thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And so when John makes this statement, no one has seen God at any time, 
uh, it, that's a statement that nobody's going to argue with. They, they might have seen a, a, a kind of a, a revelation of some aspect of God. The, Moses was shown something of the glory of God, but you can't see my face. But then it says this, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father. In the bosom of the father. That, that's a, a picture that shows intimacy and closeness and face to face. Ness. You're in someone's bosom, you're looking kind of, you're in a face-to-face -face situation. And so the Lord Jesus, he was in the bosom of the Father. No one ever got to see God in all his fullness. The Word, the only begotten Son, he was the one in the bosom of the Father, just in such an intimate place. And then it says, uh, this one, he has come, the word became flesh, uh, and he has declared him. And this word declared is a very interesting word. It, it literally has the idea of he has, has exegeted him. He, uh, when we talk about studying the Bible, we, we emphasize that we believe in exegesis. That is bringing out of the text that which is in there not eisegesis, reading into the text that which is not there. We read out from the text. That's how we get our theology. We derive it from the text of Scripture. And what, what it's telling us is that the, the Lord Jesus, the Word, nobody's seen God at any time, but the Word has exegeted him. He has told him out. He has revealed God to us. If you want to know what God is like, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to really kind of grasp who God is, what his character is, what he's like, you look at the Lord Jesus. He is the one who has brought out fully the true meaning of who God is. He has given a full account of the Father. Uh, he has made him known, told him out, revealed him to us. And I, I want to suggest to you how, how absolutely true that is. Um, I remember uh, growing up in the Roman Catholic Church, and I had this view of God as the one with the big stick up in heaven waiting to pounce upon us. And when I came to know the Lord Jesus, it completely changed my view of God the Father. Why? Because I came to know the Son. I got a true comprehension of what the Father's like. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. He's the one that initiated this whole thing. And Christ really revealed, unveiled what the Father is like. And so it's a wonderful thing to come to know the Lord Jesus, because it's the only way that anybody will ever get to know God. It's only through him. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he and he alone. He has declared him. And so what a wonderful thing it is to have God unfolded to us in the face of Jesus Christ, to see something of him. And so, of course, God's plan for you and I is for us to be as much like the Lord Jesus as it's possible to be on this earth. He's, he, ultimately, we're going to be like him. He's predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son, but he wants us to be more and more like him day by day. And how that transformation takes place is the more we gaze on the face of the Lord Jesus, the gazing on the Lord in glory, the more we look at him, the more we will begin to reflect his image down here. And one of the aspects that we're supposed to be like him in is we're supposed to be full of grace and truth like he is. And I have to confess to you that one of the difficulties we have is getting that balance right. And I think all of us, if we're really honest, if we look at our Christian experience, we might confess that there's been times when we've been all grace and no truth. Right? We, we, we've kind of ignored the truth, but we just wanted to be very good and gracious with people, especially people that are close to us and all the rest of it. And on the other hand, there's been times when we've been all truth 
and no grace. Cold, hard, offensive, you know, sticklers for the truth, but really lacking grace. And the Lord Jesus, he was full of grace and truth. And oh, oh, we need help to be like him. Oh, to be like the blessed redeemer. That's what we need to be more like him, to get that beautiful balance right where we're, we're faithful to the truth, but we minister and operate in the realm of grace. And so we see these beautiful things in the Savior, the Lord Jesus. Now, we want to move on to the witness of John and uh, John the baptizer, that is, uh, to the Lord Jesus. And we'll notice in verse 19, it says this, having moved from the prologue, we're really beginning into the gospel uh, itself now. We, up to now, the first 18 verses just mean the introduction uh, to the gospel, what, what it's all about, what the themes are about grace and truth, about rejection and receiving him, uh, the unfolding of the character of God through the Lord Jesus. The themes have been made known to us in the first uh, 18 verses, and now we're getting down to business. Now we're actually going into the, the, the gospel account that John wants to give us. And he begins with the testimony of the baptizer. And you notice he says, and this is the record of John. Uh, this is the, if you like, the testimony of John, his record. This is what he has revealed about Christ that he wants us to know. This is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And so uh, his testimony begins when the Jews come and ask him the question, who are you? Now, this term, the Jews, we're going to come across it numerous times in the Gospel of John. And every time it's used, it's always used as the Jews in hostility to Jesus and those that witness for him. It's always used in a, in a negative way. Uh, it's always used as those that are in hostility uh, in rejection, if, if you like, hostile to the Lord Jesus. Now, we've got to be careful. I want to make, be very clear what I'm going to say now, that um, we, we do not want to be guilty, as many in the church have been guilty of, is uh, an anti-Semitic mindset. Certainly, the Jews were hostile to the Lord Jesus. He came to his own. His own received him not. But on the other hand, We've got to remind ourselves, the Bible that we're studying tonight came to us through that nation. I'm very thankful that the Jews carefully, meticulously uh, copied out the scriptures, preserved the scriptures, and, and had them for us, right? And, and with the exception of Luke, every New Testament and Old Testament writer was Jewish. So we're, we're so indebted to, to the Jews. Not only did we get our Bible from them, our Savior came through them, right? Our, our Messiah, our Savior is a Jew. And so on the one hand, we recognize their hostility. And again, we should be, have a burden for them, pray for them, but we should never lose our gratitude, our indebtedness to the Jewish people and certainly pray for them uh, because, uh, first of all, God is still saving a remnant amongst them even now, and God has not finished with them. He still has a plan for the Jewish people, and so we need to make sure we've got the right attitude. But certainly, John, he wants us just to let, he's letting us know what was the prevailing attitude of the day, and the prevailing attitude of the Jews was hostility to Christ. So they sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask John, who art thou? And it's amazing to think about John's ministry. I want us just to kind of pause a second. I'd like us to go back to Matthew's gospel and just see something of John's ministry and just make maybe a couple of observations. Matthew 3, verse 5. Matthew's gospel 3, verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. 
But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And all I want us to see is just that phrase in verse 5, they went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Here's this, this man dressed in strange clothes, clothes, right? He's wrapped in camel's hair on a very strange diet. He's eating locusts and wild honey, and he's preaching in the middle of nowhere, like at, right out in the, in the wilderness. And yet crowds flock to him from all over, from the, the capital city, Jerusalem, from all Judea, from all the regions round about to come and hear this man preach. And it tells us something, doesn't it? That um, church growth thinking, John the Baptist doesn't fit that. He goes to a place in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and he preaches. But what is the attraction? Well, one thing about John was he was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb. So he's a spirit filled preacher and he's a fearless preacher. Notice what he says when the Pharisees, the religious and Sadducees come, oh, generation of vipers. And if we had more preachers like John, maybe we'd have bigger crowds flocking to hear because he was a man who was a burning and a shining light and uh, certainly a powerful, powerful preacher. And people went out to hear him. And so uh, he spoke out against the religious establishment, calling them a brood of vipers. Uh, he certainly wasn't a politically correct preacher, was he? Uh, he certainly wasn't known for tolerance. He couldn't bear the hypocrisy of the religious leadership. And he called them what they were. You guys are a bunch of snakes. And so he, he, this man... Uh, quite the man, quite the preacher, and the crowds flock. And so they get the attention. It really gets the attention of the, uh, the religious hierarchy. Why are all our congregations leaving us and flocking out to the wilderness to hear this fellow John? And so they come and want to know who he is. And so their first question is, who art thou? And of course, part of the reason maybe any movement that might in a sense, be considered disorderly and might cause the Romans uh, to feel a bit kind of concerned, uh, they, they were perturbed about. These people want to protect their place in their nation. And so anything that's perceived a threat to them, they're concerned about. So they send this delegation of priests and Levites uh, to find out who he is. And they, they ask the question, who are you? I want you to notice verse 20. John's answer, he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now, I want you to notice that the piling up of expressions there, just kind of line them up one after another. He confessed, he denied not, and then he confessed again. And, and the idea is this, he's putting tremendous e e emphatic statement together here to say, I am not the Christ. He doesn't want anybody to get the wrong idea of who he is. I'm not the Christ. And then they said, well, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Now, that's caused a lot of problems to people because we, we saw uh, and we even talked about this when we did Malachi, although that was so long ago, perhaps many of you don't even remember. But in Malachi chapter 4, in verses uh, five and six, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful, dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And so many have been disturbed by this. Uh, 
when um, John flatly denies that that he is uh, not only not the Messiah, but he says, I'm not Elijah. And uh, of course, the problem, the difficulty ha has been is that Elijah was supposed to come before the Messiah. And so that has caused a difficulty. Let's look at another couple of references before we finish this. Look at Matthew 11. Matthew's Gospel 11 in verses 11 through 15. It says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. If you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then Luke's gospel, please. Chapter 1, Luke Chapter 1, verse 17. Luke 1, 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the Lord says... If you'll receive it, this was the Elijah that was to come. And then at his birth, it's prophesied that his ministry was certainly in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so perhaps the idea is this. If the Jews had repented in a very real sense and received their Messiah, Jesus said, this is that Elijah that would come. However, because they rejected him, then the Elijah will come in the last days. And, I, and many believe, look at Revelation 11 now. Many believe that in Revelation 11, the two witnesses, if you carefully read from verse 3, it says, And I will give power to my two witnesses. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And that again reminds us of Elijah. Remember calling down fire from heaven uh, uh, on the, the, uh, the, the soldiers that came to arrest him. Uh, so that's definitely like Elijah. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Remember, Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain and it rained not for three and a half years. And again, for, during the time of their prophecy, which will be three and a half years, it rained not in the days of their prophecy. And then have power over waters to turn them to blood, to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast so forth shall kill them and so on. But I, I want you just to see that many believe, and I'm one of them, that before the, the, the Lord comes to the earth in the tribulation period, Elijah will come to prepare the way. And not just Elijah. And of course, remember, he never died. He was taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. But the other witness, some have suggested it's Enoch. I know, and the reason because uh, Enoch didn't die either. He was taken, was, he, he was not, but God took him. And so many believe Moses and Elijah will come back. Uh, sorry, Enoch and Elijah. I don't believe so. I think it's going to be Moses and Elijah who will be the two witnesses. They were with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. They will be the two witnesses who will prepare the way in the first half of the tribulation period. And as we think of them and their ministry, we see very clearly 
Moses-like actions, turning water into blood, calling down plagues. We see Elijah stopping the rain. We see Elijah calling down fire from heaven. And uh, of course, the difficulty people have with Moses is they'll say, well, Moses already died. Does that mean he dies twice? Remember, it says, not pointing unto a man once to die. Well, clearly he dies twice. But that's not a difficulty because the norm very clearly is people die once, right? Appointed unto man wants to die. But there are some exceptions in scripture. Lazarus, I'm assuming when God rose him from the grave, he had died. He was clearly dead. He'd been dead four days, but he died again. Okay, so he died twice. And there are others. Uh, all the ones, uh, the, um, the widow of Nain's son, he died too a second time. Uh, Jairus' daughter. Uh, lots of examples of people that died twice uh, in terms of, well, I won't say lots, but there are biblical examples of that. So why is it significant that it will be Moses and Elijah? Because I believe that Moses is representative of the law that will testify against the Jews when they make this covenant with the man of sin. And Elijah represents the prophets. And there'll be a twofold witness. Remember, everything's got to be established in the mouth of two witnesses. There will be a twofold witness against the apostate nation in those days, the witness of the law by Moses, the witness of the prophets by Elijah. And uh, again, they will be revealed at that time. But he says, uh, are you then Elijah? He says, I'm not. Are you that prophet? Again, that's the prophet uh, that Moses had spoken about in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 18. Let's just take our time to look there. Uh, this prophet that was going to come uh, like unto him. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Glorious chapter, really, uh, this chapter, because it talks about not listening to charmers and uh, consulting with familiar spirits or wizards or necromancers or all, all these things. Children of Israel were not to do that. But instead, it says, the Lord thy God will raise up to thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Another one's going to come like Moses. And that's going to be the Lord Jesus. He's going to be that prophet that will come. And notice what it says uh, about him. Uh, verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it's important. Uh, that they listen to that prophet. Verse 20, the prophet, uh, sorry, verse 19, it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. And so he's going to send a prophet, and that prophet's going to be the Lord Jesus. And it's interesting that when you think about the Lord Jesus as that prophet, in Matthew's gospel, when on the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus will say this no, numerous times. He says, you've heard that it was said of old time, and they'll quote something, and it's usually what Moses said. And then he says, but I say unto you. And so he's showing himself to be a lawgiver, just like Moses was. It was said of this of old time, but I say unto you. So he is that prophet that came into the world. But John says, Without question, I am not that prophet. No, he, he's absolutely uh, uh, emphatic in telling us that he, he's not the Messiah. He's not Elijah. He's not that uh, prophet that would come into the world. So verse 22, then said they unto him, who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself well what are we supposed to tell our uh, you know kind of the people who sent us 
uh, the the Pharisees who who wanted to inquire, the Sanhedrin that wanted to, how, how are we going to answer them? What should we tell them about you? And this is what John says in verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Just a voice, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And he's quoting directly from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so John says, this is who I am. Just a voice in contrast with the Lord Jesus, who is the word. I'm just a voice. And I'm here to prepare the way. Now, it's, it's a great little figure that's Im implied here. To prepare the way, if a king was coming to visit a province of his realm, the roads had to be prepared so that there would be no rough obstacles along the way. So uh, a team would be sent ahead, as it were, to prepare the way for the smooth entrance of the king. So he's the forerunner of the king preparing the way. I'll never forget when I was a boy, uh, there, there was a mining town not far from where I lived in the north of England. And it was, it was a dirty, grimy uh, town in those days, lots of coal dust everywhere. And I remember Prince Charles was coming to visit that town. And it was amazing, the, 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 the people that were sent ahead to get ready for, for the heir of the throne who was about to come. And they cleaned up the town. Uh, they painted everything. If you'd have stood still long enough, you'd have got painted. Everything uh, that could be painted was painted. They just, there was a, a getting ready for the coming of the heir to the throne. And that's exactly what John is referring to. He, but he's not interested in straightening out physical roads. He wants to straight out the, straighten out the hearts of the people, to get them ready for Messiah's coming, to get them to repent of their sins and get them in a right condition to receive their rightful Messiah. And so he is sent to prepare the way, that voice crying in the wilderness. Verse 24 says, they, were, they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said to him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elijah, nor that prophet? So why then are you baptizing? They, they're trying to get him on some technicality. You know, kind of, uh, if you're not important, if you're not one of these important people, what gives you the right, the authority to baptize? Why do you do that? Now, it's not that baptism was an unknown practice in Judaism. Actually, it was practiced regularly, but it was a right of admission for converts from other religions, what we call proselytes. And the proselytes had to go through a series of these baptisms. And the idea was to cleanse them from the pollutions, the defilement, of being part of the Gentile world in these, these uh, foreign religions. What was unique about John is that he was baptizing Jews, implying that they were dirty and defiled. And that was uh, such an affront to the self-righteous Pharisees that he would imply that there was any need of cleansing amongst the Jewish people. And so John says in verse 26, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you whom you know not. And again, is the implication that right in the crowd, while all this is going on, there stands among you one who I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. In other words, the Messiah is already there in the crowd when all this is going on. Now, he hasn't been identified to John yet, and we'll have to wait till next week, if the Lord be not come, 
to see how John would know the true identity of the Messiah. And so we'll have to wait for that. But in the meantime, in one sense, John's ministry is very similar to ours. We have to prepare the way and point to Christ. We prepare the way by using the law to convict people of their need of a savior. And then we point them to Christ as the only savior. And that's our task. We're here to be a witness to the one who is the light of the world. And we're to do it just in the same way that John did. Show people they're lost and in need. Point them to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we also need to be preoccupied with the one who was ever in the bosom of the Father, but has now declared him. And we need to be those that gaze on his lovely face and hopefully reflect his image down here. May the Lord encourage us as we consider these things together. <laughs>